Okay, guys, we're just we're gonna wait just a second. Uh, Martha will do a, an intro in just a minute, but uh, hang out just a few seconds. We'll we'll uh, get underway. Okay, everyone. Um, people are still joining in, so I'm just going to do a quick intro for everybody. Um, most of you probably know who Atmosera is, but just to give you a quick idea, um, Martha Guerin, and I'm the account manager at Atmosera for training. And we are recording this session, so if you happen to miss part of it, or you have colleagues that are interested in joining or viewing it, um, the recording can be um, downloaded or viewed in the next couple of days or so. Just send me a quick email or um, send um, us an email, you'll be fine. But just put it in the chat window. Um, so today, Atmosera is joined by our partner at Microsoft, Heather Brevard. She's a senior Azure app innovation specialist, and you'll be hearing from her shortly. So to give you a little background, Atmosera is an Atmosera is an Azure expert managed services provider, the highest Azure X accreditation that a partner can achieve. And there's only about 60 of them in the world, so we're pretty excited to be one of them. In March of 2021, Atmosera bought uh, Wintelect. Um, so now we've combined Wintelect's industry leading practices in DevOps and GitHub, app modernization, app and infrastructure, data and AI, and developer training with Atmosera's premium Azure managed services offerings. So we've created a one-stop shop for everything Azure, and we're excited to be a part of the team. Um, through our continued partnership with Microsoft, um, Azure I mean, Atmosera is eager to help our customers develop and enhance their Kubernetes skills and abilities. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat as we go through. Um, in, the end of the, in the end of the session, we're gonna have a QR code for a survey. I'll also put it in the chat window as we go through. Um, if you have any um, questions or you need any follow-up with our experts, absolutely send me a quick email, send um, Heather a quick email or one of your Microsoft reps. Uh, so thanks again for joining us and we appreciate your time and look forward to seeing you in one of our classes or our webinars or working with one of our teams. So Heather, I'm turning it over to you. Awesome. Hello everyone. I'm glad that you could join us today. Um, I'm coming to you live from Nashville, Tennessee, where it's been very rainy and stormy all day. So I hope those of you that are joining us from many other places or around the United States and around the world um, are having better weather than we are here. Um, as uh, Martha mentioned, my name is Heather Brevard, and I am a digital and app innovation specialist, specifically supporting um, health solutions and life sciences customers um, here at Microsoft, um, and very focused on application modernization, um, container services, and, and cloud native services, as well as DevSecOps. So nice to meet you all, and I just want to start this session by framing up, you know, why is why are containers and why is AKS um, such a, a big buzzword right now? Why are so many organizations looking to containers and container orchestration systems as the future of application development? Um, and then later I will hand it over to Blaze from Atmosera, who is going to walk us through a, a number of demos to help explain some of these things in further detail. So just for a little bit of context, um, Docker came on the scene and sort of the idea of containerization came on the scene, um, really started getting big around eight years ago. Um, and Kubernetes was close to follow back in 2014. I mean, this has been an emerging space for um, just about the last decade. And by about the end of this year, it's predicted that over 75% of global organizations will be running containerized applications in production. Um, so really taking the world by storm, and there's so many benefits that come from uh, containerizing and um, doing microservices with containers that we'll get into in a second. So what are some of the benefits? Why are so many of these organizations adopting containers at scale in production? 
Um, the first, as many of you may know, is the agility that comes with being able to containerize applications and ship them in microservices instead of the traditional monolithic architectures of the past. Um, so this has really helped organizations be more agile in terms of the way that they're setting up their development teams, in the way that they're working with operations, um, and in, in the way that they're able to dynamically adjust smaller aspects of the services without um, disrupting the larger systems that those containerized microservices might be part of. Um, secondly is, of course, a question of portability. Um, we're beginning to get out of this phase of development where our application workloads used to be heavily dependent on the operating systems on which they were written, on the languages in which they were written, um, and many of our operations and development teams had to think very carefully about what languages and, operate, and operating systems they were taking dependencies on. Um, but containers really makes it a lot easier to move workloads around in a uh, architecture agnostic way, which is super critical as we continue to see the software industry developing in newer and better architecture design patterns coming out. Um, so containerization makes it easier to have a lot more flexibility in terms of protecting our applications and those microservices um, for the architectures of the future. Next, we have a question of density, right? Being able to run multiple containerized microservices on the same underlying architecture um, and the underlying virtual machines makes it really easy to achieve resource efficiency and cost savings. You're not spinning up a single virtual machine to host any small application that you need up and running. And of course, there is the question of scaling as well and how we are able to scale our microservices um, independently of one another um, when they are containerized to be able to meet demands as they change throughout the day and for different aspects of the services that might be part of a larger system. So Kubernetes really emerged as the leading industry uh, containerized orchestrator back around 2016. Um, it started at Google, um, the birth father, of course, of Kubernetes being Brendan Burns, who actually is heading up our uh, Azure Kubernetes service team here at Microsoft now um, and helping Microsoft define our container roadmap for Azure going forward. And Kubernetes really emerged on the scene at a time when the orchestrator marketplace was very competitive. We had um, many other orchestrators that were on the scene, um, but for a variety of reasons, um, including the fact that Kubernetes emerged and having the strongest community in terms of uh, being able to get support and extensibility for orchestrating containers, really uh, won that uh, space race, as I would call it, of container orchestration back in the day. So Kubernetes provides a lot of the portability that many organizations are looking for, of course, has all of the extensibility, the ability to plug and, and play and decompose and recompose um, systems as needed. Um, and then a lot of the built-in self-healing, auto-replacement, auto-restart, auto-scaling um, elements that a lot of organizations were looking for when it came to managing and orchestrating large number of microservices containers at scale. But as many of you may know, if you've ever tried running Kubernetes on your own on-prem or on top of VMs in any cloud, uh, Kubernetes is really hard. There are a lot of moving parts. Um, it's very complex compared to a traditional application architecture running in IaaS um, because you have to worry about things like patching and upgrading and monitoring. How are you going to independently scale your microservices? How are you going to deal with security patching and certificate rotation and TLS configuration? Not to mention how you're going to keep things in order from a CICD automation perspective as well. Um, so running Kubernetes, uh, vanilla Kubernetes on our own, um, on, our, on hardware that we may purchase ourselves or rent from a cloud provider, is just not really feasible in the long run and really uh, creates more headache, I would say, than problems that it solves. And so a lot of those benefits of containers and orchestration are lost um, if we are using a self-managed version of Kubernetes. But the good news is, is we now have a managed version of Kubernetes that runs in um, our, our cloud providers. So Azure specifically has what we call Azure Kubernetes Service, also known affectionately as AKS. 
which takes care of a lot of these responsibilities on your behalf. So a lot of built-in functionality that assists with actually containerizing your applications, um, dealing with iterating on your applications and debugging them, plugging and playing with major CI CD tools like GitHub or Azure DevOps. Um, and then of course we fully manage all of the headaches that traditionally come with provisioning, um, upgrading, patching, um, having to deal with uh, reliability and availability, scaling, and of course, monitoring and logging as well. And of course, uh, AKS, this service does not exist in the back, uh, a vacuum. It's backed by, of course, the entire Kubernetes and containers community, as well as the variety of data services, security services, networking and storage services that we have available in Azure and all of the development tools um, that Microsoft supports in terms of um, writing the various services that would end up on that Kubernetes infrastructure. So one thing I wanna call out, you know, before I hand it over to Blaze, um, we do have a new program that actually recently came out here at Microsoft called the uh, Application Modernization Program or the AMP program. Um, where Microsoft is really eager to help customers uh, realize the value that comes with containerizing and converting their large monoliths into microservices and orchestrating that on AKS. And so as part of this program, um, we provide technical assistance as well as um, investing in partners like Atmosera to come in and help assess all of the applications that you have running and their level of fit for something like AKS and then actually assist with that migration as well. Um, so I highly encourage you, you know, if you like what you see today in terms of the demos and you see value in how your organization can move these things or use these things going forward um, in terms of migrating to uh, AKS or re-architecting re your systems on, on AKS, then please reach out to your Microsoft representative or any of the representatives on the phone from Atmosera um, we have really just a great investment program to help your organization get to that future state of application development and take advantage of those innovative services going forward. Awesome. So that is all from me, um, Blaze. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you and we can start getting into some demos about what this stuff looks like in action. All right. Thanks, Heather, for that. Let me, let me share my screen here. Um, let me see if I can make this happen. Oh boy, how do I do this? Share screen. Um, show my screen. There we go. Um, which screen are you guys? I'm sorry. This is. How do I? Um, I want to show that one. Okay. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes, I think that's a yes. Yep. You're good. Perfect. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had to kind of juggle a couple. I have like a couple of monitors and make sure the right one's up. Okay, so uh, let's go right into technical content. I think Heather did it. The, the kind of the the why. I'm going to talk more about the the technical details of this. So um, part of part of the challenge of Kubernetes, and uh, Heather mentioned a lot of this, is is, is just understanding the the, the Kubernetes ecosystem, the, the landscape of Kubernetes, everything that goes into making Kubernetes happen. And um, so the idea is to figure out what you need to know in order to even begin to get at Kubernetes. And there's really a lot of vocabulary, if you will, that, that goes into making that a reality. So this is one thing that I like to kind of think about this as a, just as a vocabulary lesson in Kubernetes because the concepts that Kubernetes employs are really nothing new. It just kind of repackages them and then calls them something in the Kubernetes context that has specific meaning in that context, but might mean something completely different in another context. And that was one of the biggest frustrations I found when I was learning Kubernetes. So um, with that in mind, so the ideas that I'm gonna be showing you today are nothing particularly revolutionary, it's just, oh, that's how you do this in Kubernetes talk, and that's how this is gonna work on Azure. As um, Heather said, there's a lot of things that I'm not gonna show you because it's managed infrastructure. There's a lot of things that you don't have to really deal with, but I'm gonna touch on some of those content, uh, 
co concepts as we walk through a lot of this stuff that's more app oriented and specifically about getting your applications running on Kubernetes, which is really what you focus on as a developer whenever you're working with Kubernetes on Azure rather than maintaining a cluster, which is, as Heather said, that's not trivial. That's, that's a lot of work. And um, so what we're going to do is kind of look at it from the other side. Or how do I get my stuff on Azure? How do I make it work? And I'm going to try to introduce you to the, the basic bare bone concepts of that in this because there's just a ton and ton of stuff uh, related to Kubernetes that gets been hours just talking about. So let's go ahead and start uh, with just the most basic thing on Kubernetes, and that's a pod. So the mo this is the most basic building block of Kubernetes. Like you'll hear people talk about containers. But containers are really kind of the uh, how you package your application. But once you get a, a container built and a container image di di distributed to a container registry, Kubernetes actually takes that container and wraps it in another layer called the pod. In many kind, in many uh, demos and different kinds of things and different kinds of contexts, these these are almost treated synonymously. Typically, you have one to one correlation between pods and containers, and that's why I sometimes. I think people get these two confused. They're really two different things because a pod is the most fundamental building block on Kubernetes. In fact, with Kubernetes, you can run other kinds of containers, not just Docker containers. You can run other kinds of applications. The encapsulation around that's going to be a pod, though. And a pod can actually contain multiple Docker containers, but generally, as a best practice, you only have a single, what I would call, application container running. You might have what we call a sidecar container that's useful for other things that I'm not going to get into today. But the basic building block is this right here, and that is a container. And it is what has your Docker, I'm sorry, your pod, which has your Docker container. And it provides your network connectivity, it provides your storage, and it provides some ways of just organizing it with things like labels and names and other things that are going to be related to running that pod. So it's the encapsulation you put around it. It's got RAM, CPU, and networking that are provided to the container running in that particular uh, pod. And once you have that, this is what you take and you distribute on a Kubernetes cluster in many different ways to create your application to get it up and running on Kubernetes. So uh, let's skip through this. So the next thing that we want to think about on um, Kubernetes is, let me uh, pull up another slide here. Um, the, I'm going to fast forward in this deck a little bit here. Um, and um, this is, ah, it's not where I want to be. So, gosh, what are, let me see here. Um, let me fast forward in this deck here. Let me uh, pull up. Uh, this slide right here. So, not this one. This one, sorry. Uh, this one right here is, come on. Sorry, guys, this is not cooperating with me. It's put my, I want to go to this slide. This one right here. So this is the one I want to talk about right here. This is the Kubernetes architecture. So a pod, once we have our pods up and running, the uh, Please, pod, I don't think that's it. I'm sorry? Unless you see an ABC. That's all we see. ABC. Yep. I, huh? What happened? Can you see it now? Let no. me see. Nope. Uh, something happened on my machine. It just started throwing stuff up randomly and just. Uh, let's try this right here. Um, how about now? You see. Yep, got it. Ah, what the heck Kubernetes happened? There? Architecture. I'm sorry. Okay, it's good. Just, sorry, go I don't. I don't know what happened there. I was like a page. I was, I was looking at some fonts or something. Um, so this is the Kubernetes architecture. As I mentioned, a pod is the, the most basic building block of Kubernetes. So once you have a pod, you end up deploying a pod to a Kubernetes node. And a Kubernetes node is one of several different um, uh, machines that run Kubernetes workloads. So a Kubernetes node on a cluster is something that you have to be cognitively aware of because whenever you start to distribute your applications on Kubernetes,
you end up having a lot of these nodes that are working with one another uh, to, to, to load balance things, to move uh, work around, to have a compute cluster where your application is distributed across that. And there is a lot of components that go into orchestrating that. Now, I'm not going to go into a, a lot of details about all of what these do, but a couple of things that you do need to be aware of is the fact that you are running on a node and that you do have uh, some so essentially an abstraction of a network on top of that that provides the connectivity between the nodes so it's more transparent. So whenever you go to deploy to AKS, you have to choose kind of networking integrations you want to do. And the networking integration is what gives you uh, the transparent networking so that when you deploy a pod to say this node over here, it can talk to another node seamlessly without having to figure out all the routes and DNS and all these other various kinds of things that are a part of trying to deploy this on something like a virtual machine. Now, all this up here, what we call a Kubernetes master is brokered by Azure. Azure. It's uh, exposed as the API. You as a developer or an operator on Kubernetes inter interact with an API, and that is part of uh, a Kubernetes cl uh, cluster that is running on a Kubernetes master node. And it basically just tells the nodes what to do. And so there's a lot of things that go into making that happen. And once it orchestrates everything, it's going to load balance everything across your uh, Kubernetes architecture. You're going to distribute your pods across all your nodes. And then you're going to have a something called a kube proxy right here, which is going to provide a lot of the networking integrations for you, a lot of the exposure for your applications to a network to the internet. It could be internal, external. And it's also going to uh, give you a lot of load balancing and other kinds of similar schemes like that that we traditionally would get with network hardware. Another important component of this is the kubelet. And this is the part of a Kubernetes node that receives things from uh, the controllers up here, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's, it receives the commands from the, the Kubernetes master, and it's what orchestrates the distribution of pods on your nodes. So you're going to see something called a kubelet whenever you uh, run Kubernetes, and it's it's important that you understand what that really is. It's just basically the agent that runs on a node that, that is controlling the pods in that particular context. And if you're using Azure Kubernetes uh, services integration with something like Azure Container Instances, you'll see something called a virtual kubelet, and it's just basically using compute available to Azure Kubernetes, uh, Azure Container Instances connected to an Azure Container uh, services like what we see uh, more represented in a traditional setup like this right here. But all in all, this is very uh, typical of any Kubernetes architecture, which you're going to see regardless if it's running on Azure, on-premise, aka uh, on Amazon or Google, whatever that might be. So with that in mind, let's deploy something to a Kubernetes node just so that you can kind of see this in action. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a pod on Kubernetes, and I'm going to expose it to a network. And that network is basically going to give me the um, exposure that I need to connect to that pod through a browser. So this is basically going to take a container, put it into pod, and connect it to a network, and then we'll see that uh, working as a demo here. So let me pull up a, a file here. And this, uh, can you guys see my text editor here? This is uh, Notepad++. Are you able to see it? Yes. All right, perfect, thanks. I uh, just wanna make sure. So what I've got here is a, a, what we call a deployment, and uh, I'm, we'll get into a little bit of details about what this does in a minute. And the deployment is basically what is going to deploy the pod to Kubernetes. And there's a command line utility called kubectl, and kubectl is basically what you use as a developer and administrator to manage things on the CLI uh, on a Kubernetes cluster. So once you have your Kubernetes cluster created, you connect kubectl from your local environment up to your Kubernetes cluster, and it's going to interact with that API server, or the API in this case on AKS, and it's how you're going to be able to deploy pods to it. So if I do a kubectl apply dash F, and I'm going to deploy this file, what this is going to do is create a pod on my Kubernetes cluster. So if I go kubectl get pod, it's going to show me uh, a pod right here that's running. So if I have this one right here, I've actually got a couple others running right here, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but this is the one I just created and it's called Keen. And that's what's defined in this file down here. And it's it's basically 
a Commander Keen game that I've deployed into a container, but it's running on Kubernetes. If I do kubectl get service, I should see a, a couple of services here, but I'm going to see one that's specifically called Keen right here. And this is the one that is actually that I'm actually interested in uh, that I just deployed uh, just a second ago. And so it did it did update it. I've had this up and running for a while, but basically what this does is it gets an external IP because this is what the kubectl is doing. Uh, is telling the Kubernetes cluster to get um, an IP address from Azure. So Azure Kubernetes Services is going to go out and ask Azure for a public IP address. And as part of that orchestration, it's going to take that uh, IP address. Once Azure uh, allocates that, it's going to basically forward all the traffic from that public IP address back into my container. And it's going to do that all behind the scenes, basically, uh, without me having to configure anything beyond what I configure in my config file here. And that's one of the beauties of AKS as opposed to something like your traditional uh, Kubernetes environment because it's all automated. Uh, you don't have to do a whole lot of different things on Azure Kubernetes services to make this all work. Uh, it's just basically going to give it all to you for free. And um, this is my container now. This is the one that I just deployed. I just copied the password uh, out of my I'm sorry, I copied the IP address out of my uh, configuration, and I'm going to deploy this, uh, connect to this, and actually play a little game on um, uh, this little container. So this is actually running a DOS emulator inside of a container running on Kubernetes and then streaming the results back to a browser window. So it allows me to play a little DOS game inside of a browser window. And so this is an old game I used to play back when I was like in, I guess, uh, fourth grade or third grade, and it's called Commander Keen, and it's still just a slide, uh, side-scrolling action game, and it allows me to play it on a container and stream the results back to this using uh, web sockets and Canvas API and this, but all that's really irrelevant to this, but this is a container uh, running in a pod with a network connection on Kubernetes, so that's what I'm doing here. So there's a couple other things that are going to be important to understanding how to get workloads from um, just, a, just a pod into something like a load balance configuration, which is what I want to talk about next. And that is uh, using um, yeah, using something on Kubernetes called a service. So let me get back over here to my deck and uh, we'll, we'll talk about what this is. And um, let me get over here to the slide here. Let me get out of this. Um, and I'll start this back up over here. Uh, using this slide that has what I want to talk about here. And this is a service. Uh, can you guys still see my screen? We can. Service is good. So nothing janky happened there. Um, so this is uh, what a service looks like. So I actually just deployed one of these a second ago. I deployed a service uh, that looked like this. However, it only had a single pod and a single service. So once you have a pod deployed, there's a lot of different things that you can do within the context of that pod. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of services that you can deploy. So uh, there's a lot of different, like there is a lot of different kinds of applications that you can run in the cloud. One uh, common one is microservices. A, a microservices uh, would be basically a service that you run an instance of or multiple instances of, and you want to expose that uh, to a network somehow. And so, you, and then you want to put a load balancer in front of that. And then you want the load balancer to distribute the, the traffic across that, that given uh, set of pods. Now, the, the part of that workload that actually controls the behavior of, of, of scaling the pods and making sure that they're all up and running is, is, is a replication controller or sometimes just called a deployment on Kubernetes. And that's one kind of controller. Now, once we have that controller running and it's created all the instances of the pod that I want to run, say I want to run 10, 15, 30 instances of that particular service, I need a way to load balance that across all the pods that I have running. And that's what a, that's what a, uh, a service is. And a service is basically just a network connection in the Kubernetes context. And services are a kind of controller, but the services that I'm going to be talking about here are basically just going to be exposing whatever it is that I'm going to be using my application for to the network. And then it's going to provide some kind of load balancing scheme across that. So this is what the typical architecture looks like. 
I have a cloud. I have a cloud coming into the Kube proxy, which is something that we mentioned already. And then it's going to load balance across uh, any number of different replica sets or, or deployments, whatever uh, controller that you're using to orchestrate these pods down here. And the, the deployment uh, would then uh, receive the request by way of a load balancer rather than just having a single deployment like we saw with that demo I just did, where it was just a single pod with a single uh, IP address connected to it. So this is a very traditional setup, a very typical setup. So let me show, it, show you what this looks like using Kubernetes. So Kubernetes uses uh, what, they, what we call manifest files. And a manifest file is basically just a declaration of a desired state for a service or a controller of some kind. So in this one, as I mentioned, this is my service that I wanna do load balancing on. So this is um, a service that is deploying an application on port 80. And so this is running a, uh, this is basically going to tell Kubernetes, create a service, expose it to the network. Here's the port that I wanna run it on. And this is the backend port that I wanna hit. And this is the, and this port right here is defined down here as part of my deployment. And this is what control, this is what is going to tell me how many of my pod that I want to create. So my deployment says, I want three replicas of this pod. Uh, here's the container image that I want to use for this pod. This container port is going to be on port 3000. And this is going to then to tell Kubernetes, create three instances of this, distribute it across however many nodes you need for it. Once you have that up, then the service is going to be aware of that, that deployment. And it's going to say, okay, now that I've got all these instances running, I can then load balance across all of those different instances of my pod. Uh, my pods that are deployed are being controlled by this deployment down here. So if I start this, um, I can do exactly like we just did a second ago. Uh, I'm going to go to deploy this. I'm going to use kubectl again, and I'm going to use kubectl apply dash f, and I'm going to call this one service deployment. And this is going to create a service called node app service one, and it's going to deploy a container called node app one. So if I do kubectl get pods, um, we're gonna see a list of pods here uh, that, I, that, I, that I just created. And that's these right here that I just created right here. These are running. Uh, and I still have that Commander Keen pod running right there. And these are the pods that I just created. So if I do get deployment, it's going to show me the deployments that I currently have. And I have this node app one deployment right here running. And that's the one I just created. Although I, I just basically updated it when I did the apply, it just has, three pods that are up and running right here uh, in this particular uh, deployment. This is the other deployment that I did for one node, uh, one a single pod, but this is the one that's gonna be the load balancing across those different pods that it's controlling. And if I do get services, it's gonna show me the services that it's deployed. And now I have two services, both running on this, this same AKS cluster, and they're all, they're being exposed through a two different public IP address. One is coming back into this node app and being load down balanced across those three uh, pods that I just created. And this is still running that commander keen pod in the background. So these are all running on the same cluster, but I now have two public IP addresses here. So let's go ahead and launch this um, here. And uh, I'll um, go ahead and um, uh, let's go ahead and deploy. Let's go ahead and do this right here and see what if I can get this ah that's not what i wanted http colons there we go and there's my there's my uh application running right there that's telling me that's reaching into the back end now this particular load balancing it, it's just basically going to the same um the same pod every time it's not really it's not doing a distributed but i'm going to do a demo in a minute we're going to see it distribute it across multiple pods here in a second but this is basically if i was to harp on that a little bit more eventually it would it would probably go to another um instance of the pod let me see if i can get that in another browser window here it's still hitting the let's try incognito it's still hitting the same one but it's still all going to the same but i still have three instances behind it, it just doesn't really want to i'm not stressing it enough to really cause it to go to a second instance of this particular pod right here but in any case that's deployed and it's running in that second container that we saw there in the background so that is the uh first um of uh, uh, the services I want to demo right here.
So if we go and look at different kinds of controllers, um, there's a several different kinds of controllers that we can talk about that we can expose as services or that we can use to uh, manage those pods in the background. So we looked at controllers, that's what actually distribute, that's what creates the pods and, and then uh, controls how they get uh, load balance and how they um, get distributed across the various nodes. One of the common ones that we were just looking at is deployments, but a couple of other ones that you might be interested in are stateful sets. These are useful for mono, uh, these are useful for applications such as database clusters. If you can run those in Kubernetes, sometimes a stateful set will allow you to have a master node configuration where you need the, a, 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 no, a single node to come up first for all the other nodes to connect to it. So that's what a stateful set would be useful for. And you can create dependencies with stateful sets and other things like that. A daemon set's another useful one if you want a single instance or, or multiple instances of a given uh, pod on every node in your in your cluster. That's a really useful one right there. And then jobs are useful for doing things uh, in the background if you needed to do processes to run those like on a schedule, for instance, or, or something like that. Deployments and replica, replication controllers and replica sets are kind of an iteration of one another. Deployments are most like are most likely the ones that you're going to encounter in Kubernetes. However, sometimes you might see replica sets or replication controllers, and these were uh, kind of some earlier versions of what eventually became deployments. For most intents and purposes nowadays, deployments are probably what you're going to use anyway uh, for microservice type applications where you can have in number of instances of the same service running across your your Kubernetes cluster. If it needs to have a specific set of of pods running or a specific set of containers running, that's where stateful sets are going to come in handy. So these are useful for that kind of stuff. So um, and another kind of couple kinds of services that you might be interested in uh, thinking about on Azure Kubernetes services are are these right here. Um, Load balancer is the one I just I just used. Now, load balancer is basically a public IP address. It's almost a misnomer because you can load balance on a cluster IP and node port, but that's just basically saying, get me an external IP from the network, and I'm going to expose this service as an external service relative to the uh, the the nodes that I'm running. So in the case of AKS, it's going to grab a public IP address and assign it to the node. A cluster IP is basically an internal network, uh, internal IP address, and so it's going to grab an internal IP address and expose the service on an internal network versus an external network. And then this right here is called a uh, is called a node port. This is useful for dev environments. It basically uses the, an existing IPs, uh, an existing IP on a given uh, node, and it just selects a port. So you want to assign port 23,000. On a node port, you can do that with node port. It's very useful for debugging workloads. But in any case, uh, this one is the one I typically use for debugging or in dev environments, and this is the one I'll use for production-oriented workloads. But it's basically just reconfiguring the YAML file that we just saw with whichever type you want to use. But otherwise, they pretty much all work the same. Once the traffic is inside of Kubernetes, it'll load balance it across your deployments and things like that. So. I want to look at one more thing uh, before uh, we go to questions, and this is uh, this is the idea of of ingress. Now, ingress is for HTTP-based traffic. So, in the context of Kubernetes, we we've looked at pods, we've looked at um, we've looked at pods, we looked at controllers and how you create controllers, we looked at services and how those are exposed. Services are for TCP, UDP-based traffic. So that's what you would use if you're deploying something like uh, a database and you want to expose that on a specific port or an FTP server or something like that. Um, that can be used to expose HTTP-based web war, uh, workloads. However, it's not necessarily the best option for that. And that's where we get into this concept of ingress controllers. So ingress controllers are strictly based around HTTP and HTTPS traffic. And this is gonna be very similar to what you can do with something like an F5 device uh, or, or big IP F5 device, or you can do similar things with something like HA proxy, Nginx, you can use traffic or any of these other HTTP based controller uh, uh, load balancers that do things like SSL offloading, URL rewriting, um, 
do uh, HTTP based load balancing. They can do header injections. They can do all kinds of stuff specifically based around the HTTP protocol. So rather than having to have a, a an external uh, unit to do that in Kubernetes, it's basically baked into the Kubernetes ecosystem. And you can actually use one of many different kinds of controllers that exist out there. The one I'm gonna be using today is based on Nginx and it's probably the most commonly used one. However, if you like traffic and you wanna use traffic to manage ingress traffic, you can do that. If you, uh, there's a more advanced ones that you can use. You can use Azure Application Gateway. If you wanna use that for an ingress controller, you can use the, the, the Microsoft provided ingress uh, controller for uh, app gateways and it will actually configure the application gateway for you on uh, Azure. You don't have to touch it. It will provision it for you. It will set up all the routes for you. It'll set up any SSL that you wanna include. It will do all of that without having to, to manage that. Uh, you can do it directly from um, ingress YAML files, which we're gonna look at an example of in a moment. But this is, this is really useful for HTTP based applications in Kubernetes because it can save a lot of headaches as well because it integrates so well with the other things that we've talked about. This is the typical architecture right here for it. You have the cloud out here and then you have an ingress controller that kind of sits on the edge. And this is really where you put it. You, you put it out in front and then you basically in the ingress controller, you define HTTP based routes and this is URL based routing. So this is everything after the, U, the host name. Actually, you can even use the host name if you want uh, to, to define these routes in the, in the context of, of Kubernetes. Uh, so you basically use URL-based routing, and based on the route that's part of the URL, you can, you can farm off traffic, say, so route one, go to this replica, go to this, this pod set over here, route uh, two, go to another one, and then the traffic will then be routed based on that. Then it hits the service right here, then the service will behave just like we saw already, where it will load balance that traffic across whatever number of pods you have managed by that service, whatever it's exposing. So if I have 15 instances of the pod, the service is actually what's going to uh, control a lot of that traffic under the hood for distributing it across the pod. Uh, but the ingress controller is, is there to handle the routing for that. So it can do a lot of that uh, stuff that we just mentioned, SSL offloading, uh, header injection, header modification, um, anything you can do with HTTP based routing, basically you can do with an ingress. And the same thing is gonna happen here. So let's go and look at an example of this. Uh, this is one of the most common architectures for this. And that, I'm gonna show you an example of this, what this actually looks like in code. So I have the, the code for this right here. And this is gonna look a lot like what we just saw when we look at the services down below, but the ingress itself is pretty straightforward. So after you install what we call the, index, the, the, the ingress controller, you have to tell Kubernetes which one you're wanting to use. In this case, I'm using Nginx. So I'm telling, I'm, I'm telling Nginx, I'm using uh, an Nginx uh, ingress controller. The markup for these down here, the spec, this down here, this part looks the same regardless of what kind of controller you're using. So I can use Traffic, I can use Azure Application Gateway, I can use whatever uh, right here. Uh, but the spec down here, all of these rules and all this, this can these conventions, these are the same regardless of whatever ingress controller you use. These annotations right here are specific to the ingress controller, and this is. Like if there's something about the Nginx um, controller that you want to use uh, or something that you want to configure, this is how you do that. These are these annotations are, are, are specific to the, um, the the controller that I'm using here, in this case, in Nginx. If I was using some other controller, I wouldn't use these. I would have different annotations for that. So that's something specific to the controller. This down here is not. And this is really where I want to focus because this is the part where I define the routes. So based on the URL routes is how I'm going to direct traffic coming into my ingress controller into whatever uh, service that's going to be underneath this ingress controller. So this path right here is basically just the, just the root path. So in this case, I'm basically saying anything at the root, go to this service right here. Notice though that I'm doing the same thing for app one. I'm sending it to the same service. You can do that with this. So if I wanted anything at the root, 
go to node app one anything at app one go to node app one and it all goes to that same service that i'm doing right here and i can also define regex expressions and do all kinds of fun stuff with this if i want to create some complex rules in the path to do regex matches against these to determine which place they go to and that is um one common way to um get very complex routing or URL based routing into this if you want to do that kind of stuff. And there's a whole lot of conventions I'm not even talking about here. I have another app and it's the same app really. It's Node app, it's the same Node app. I just have a different name and I called it app two right here. And this one goes to a different set of uh, different pods that are being exposed by a different service. And then I also have the commander keen one right here. And notice on this one, I'm using some URL uh, some regex matches here because the way that this one works is a little bit different from the way this one works up here because th th this one i've got configured anything that comes into the, this particular node app i don't care what the request looks like it's going to return the same results this one needs to know everything after the slash so uh, I, I need to prepend it with slash keen and it's going to match everything after that with whatever comes after it and then it will then pass that back to the um the pod behind it as the URL that that pod is going to understand. So that's why this one looks a little different is because I need to have some better intelligence as to what's going on underneath the, the hood here. And so all of these are exposed on different services, which are defined down here. Here's the, um, the service for node, the first node app here's the, and here's the actual deployment. This is exactly like the first one. I, uh, the, sorry, that node app I deployed. Here's the, here's the second service right here. And here's the deployment for it. Notice that I'm using a cluster IP here because that's the, that's exposing an internal IP. I'm not exposing a public IP. Everything is gonna come into the same public IP and I'm using URL-based routing in this case uh, to get to that. This down here is the deployment for it. And here is the, the third service that I'm exposing. This is the Commander Keen uh, pod that I, I deployed and the service is called Keen. And this, this is the deployment for that as well. So I have, Three services, three deployments, and an ingress all defined as part of this same ingress con, uh, configuration right here. The ingress is configured to expose three services, which are in front of three different uh, deployments, which is going to expose about seven different pods to the uh, to the internet once I get this deployed. So this is a fairly not a huge deployment, but it's you know it, it demonstrates what we're trying to get at here. So let's go ahead and open this guy up. In a command prompt here, let me uh, deploy it. So let's do kubectl and let's do apply dash F and I'm gonna do ingress um, for this particular one right here. And it's going to configure and deploy all those pods right here. So if I do kubectl um, get pods, I'm gonna see all the pods, it's terminating the pods because basically I'm using the same services that I had in my other demos for this particular one right here. It's terminating the, the old pods because it's restarting them under new services right here. And so I've got, um, should have, you know, exactly um, beyond the, uh, the uh, you know, seven pods running right now. So I have three for uh, one node app. Node app one has three pods in its deployment. Node app two has three app pods in its deployment. And then the commander keen has a single pod in its deployment. So I have three different deployments. If I look at those, as we get deployments, I'm going to see the three deployments right here, and that's going to show me all of the, the deployments that I have. If I do get services, I'm going to see the, the services now deployed. This is the original uh, one that I deployed. Uh, this is the Kubernetes API right here. That's not the one I'm interested in. This is the the services that I deployed as part of the uh, uh, YAML file. I just deployed the manifest, and this is the other service. And then if I do get ingress, it's going to show me the ingress controller for this. So ingress is going to show me the HTTP ingress that I had defined here, and there's the public IP address that it got from Azure. So this is again just going out, grabbing a public IP address from the from the pool of available IP addresses on Azure, and then assigning it to my ingress. I did not have to do anything under the hood to get that IP address. I just basically said deploy this Azure. Uh, Azure Kubernetes Services goes and asks Azure for an IP address. It gets it, and then it, it configures everything under the hood to expose this IP address to my cluster. Under the hood is actually using a Azure Load Balancer uh, in front of this to distribute everything from this public IP address across all the nodes I have on my AKS cluster. And then 
internally, it's then hitting all of these um, IP addresses right here that are on my cluster IP addresses. And then from there, uh, that's getting routed back into my services and then back into my pods right there. So let's go ahead and see if this works right here. So let's pop open a new browser window. And uh, let's see, let me, um, let's, th this should give me email to my node app one. And so this is just returning the, the name of the node app right here um, that we see right here. If I go back down here and we look at our deployment, uh, that's the same as what we see in our, in our uh, pods right here. So this is the one that, this is this pod right here, the one that's currently up. And so if I refresh that, we're just seeing it hit all the other pods right here. So let's just test the routes app one right here. If I look at the routes there, we're um, uh, we're hitting the same set of pods behind the scene because that's the route. It's getting routed to the exact same pods, even though I'm using a different URL based routes. If I change it to two though, we're going to hit node app two right here. And so this is getting load balance across node app two. And um, this is uh, distributing the work across that second set of pods I deployed as part of that second deployment. And then if I go into that commander keen pod, if I go keen right here, it's going to take me over to that Keen app that I was running there. I need to put Keen in front of this uh, because the the URL match uh, should have um, matched it like this uh, to pull up to that um, that instance of Commander Keen that I want to run here. Let's punch in the password and then let's go to C and then let's do and install this game. And this is, again, using URL based routing here, but it's all done by way of you know, WebSockets against you know, a route, a kind of a, an arbitrary route right there um, in the background. And uh, if I do, I think I just did this. And then this will start my game again, uh, running it. Um, oops, I hit, I hit re refresh there. Uh, type in this password, connect. Um, there we go. There, there, there's my, uh, there's my little game, and now I can play Commander Keen inside of my pod that that is now running through an ingress controller that's running through a service that is running through a public IP address that it's sharing with a bunch of other services under the hood, and you can see that this is, you know, running pretty fine, fast, and the, um, you know, considering that it's streaming the results as well as all those other containers and pods and all the other infrastructure that's all running on the same uh, Kubernetes cluster in the background. So that is. Uh, soup to nuts, kind of what you can expect a Kubernetes deployment to look like whenever you go to actually deployment. Now, there's a lot that I haven't talked about here. Uh, I do want to you know, take time for questions, though, because I think there's some uh, probably a lot of questions that folks might have related to this. But in any case, let me get back to the, the deck and um, uh, talk about, uh, let's see, let me pull that back up right here. Go ahead and launch this. And uh, let's see, what, just to recap what we did here. All right. We talked about AKS. I didn't talk a whole lot about ACR. Uh, we looked at the tools and we looked at the, the fundamentals of, uh, of Kubernetes and uh, how to deploy an app through. I didn't talk about ACR in this particular one, but that's Azure, Azure uh, Container Registry. Uh, I didn't go a lot of, into a whole lot of details about that, but. Uh, any questions you might have, please do pose those inside of the question feature on here, and I'll pull these up and see if I can answer some of these uh, right here. So let me pop open this and see what we have uh, in terms of questions and uh, see if we can answer some of these. All right. Um, let's see. So if you have these... Um, So Matt has a question. Um, it says, can you discuss K8 clusters that run across Azure and on-prem? Um, can you discuss uh, discuss uh, across Azure and on-prem? Okay, so there there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Like you can't, it's not advisable to, um, um, it's not advisable to to run a Kubernetes cluster across like to, i would run a aks on aks and run an on-prem cluster on premise but not create try to create a, a hybrid cluster across a vpn or across express route whatever it might be because that's generally an anti-pattern um but if you wanted to run uh across aks on premise and 
uh, in Azure, what you can do is you can run that using Azure Arc, which Azure Arc is a, a feature, has features for deploying containers across multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters, regardless of where they reside. They can be on other clouds or on-premise or on Azure, and you can use Azure Arc to kind of manage all of that uh, as well. And so that is one of the uh, ways to do that. Another way is to um, just have uh, something like Azure Front Door. Uh, if you want to do that, if you, uh, you can use Azure Front Door to kind of act as a front end load balancer. If you want to have something on premise and connect back through a express route, you could use Azure Front Door to uh, integrate with on premise and on, um, on Azure. Or uh, you could use something like Traffic Manager if you wanted to use DNS based load balancing. Uh, and have your cluster exposed publicly on premise and then um, publicly on AKS, you could use something like Traffic Manager in that case. Now, there isn't any integrated tooling in a Azure that provides a way to do that other than Azure Arc, uh, but you can still use uh, the, the load balancing features that come with Traffic Manager or Front Door that will allow you to kind of distribute that work across th those kind of environments if you wanted to run your own uh, Kubernetes cluster on-premise and one in Azure as well. Um, so Matt asks, can you discuss how to, um, uh, let's see, let's see here. So another one uh, would be, how do you, have, how can we uh, containerize Azure cloud services to uh, which run a .NET framework 4.7.2? Um, yes, you can run the um, you can run containerized apps in .NET 4.7.2 on Windows containers. Now, what you can do in Kubernetes on Azure is you can create what we call node pools, and I didn't get into that. But what basically a node pool is is a set of compute that has uh, an, a, an operating system associated with it plus a, a VM class associated with it. So I might create a node pool that has D series uh, VMs, DS3s, and they have four cores, eight gigs of RAM in them, and they're running Windows. And on that node pool, I can deploy node, I can deploy into Windows containers .NET 4.7.2 applications in that uh, particular uh, that particular node pool. Uh, and that would basically say um, using Windows containers running uh, whatever you know, IIS-based Windows containers on Kubernetes running on Windows node pools on AKS. And you can mix uh, various kinds of operating systems in node pools. So I can have Linux node pools and I can have Windows node pools as part of the same Kubernetes cluster. I just have to use what they call taints and tolerations uh, in Kubernetes to tell the, the controller uh, on my um, Kubernetes cluster where to deploy those specific kinds of workloads. So I can say deploy my Windows workloads to my Windows node pools, and otherwise Kubernetes is going to freak out and not going to work. So that's uh, what uh, would work there. Um, so uh, next one is: is Kubernetes is Linux based? No Windows based pods or containers, correct? No, um, that is not. You can Kubernetes is Linux based. The Kubernetes, however, can run on Windows. So one of the it's not a not a not a, not a major use case for it, but the ability to run Windows containers is supported. So the idea that you can take, uh, use the same Docker image, well, not the same Docker image, but the same Docker paradigms and build Windows containers and deploy those to a container registry and then deploy those to a Kubernetes node that integrates with AKS is a supported story on Kubernetes and on Azure. You can also create um, Kubernetes nodes on on premises with Windows Server that is supporting containers. It's a feature of Windows Server that you can turn on, uh, and you can use uh, Windows containers on Windows Server as part of an on-premises deployment if you want to do that as well. So yes, you can deploy Windows workloads and Linux load workloads to Kubernetes. It's just you have to make sure that you have the the appropriate nodes deployed to the cluster to uh, support both Windows workloads and Linux workloads, but on AKS, you're, you're required to at least have some 
node pool that is a Linux node pool. Uh, but you can also add to that node pool uh, a Windows containers as well. Uh, next question is, how how do you watch pod logs or e existing graphics tool for, for Azure? On Azure, the, the way to watch logs is to use Azure's uh, uh, use Azure Monitor for that, and that will take all of the, the you can take all the node pods. There's a special integration with AKS that will take all of the node pods, all the, the container logs essentially, and all the contain all the Kubernetes logs and pump those into an, a log analytics workspace. And Azure Monitor is a part of that, so you can dashboard it. You can then use the log analytics to view those uh, those pod uh, those logs in log analytics if you want to query them and do various things against that. If you wanna create alerts, you can do all that with uh, log analytics workspaces as well. And you can also take all that and pump it into um, something like a SIM, which is what you would get with Azure Sentinel. So Azure Sentinel can monitor Kubernetes uh, clusters. They can be on-premise if you want, uh, they, it can, but it can use log analytics workspaces to manage all that. And that basically will give you uh, the various kinds of things that you have there. Um, Let's see, uh, how do you watch logs? Uh, okay, we just look at that. So uh, one, let's see, what do I have here? Uh, so one, one can have an IIS pod then. Yeah, yes, uh, yes, that is, a, that is a question that came in. Uh, you can have IIS-based pods, really containers. Uh, the, the pod would be the, the Kubernetes wrapper around that, but you can have a Windows container running IIS. Uh, it is uh, one of the available containers from Microsoft, and you would need a Windows host to run that. But yes, you can have .NET 4.7.2 running on IIS in a container on Kubernetes. That is supported. So yes, you can answer that. Uh, you can do that. Um, how do I manage performance of pods? There's a couple of ways to do that. I didn't get into a lot of that, but one way you can do that is just by querying the logs. Um, you can query the logs themselves on Kubernetes. You can also install some third-party tools uh, such as Grafana, which is integrated with Kubernetes, and Grafana with something like uh, Prometheus, which is another tool, uh, will allow you to create a dashboard that you can connect to, and that will um, give you real-time uh, dashboards about what's going on inside of your pods and it monitors things like logs and performance and other things like that. You can also create some of that with um, Azure uh, Azure Monitor if you wanna create performance logging based on Azure Monitor because it also integrates with those. You can uh, use that as a way to monitor pods too. So there's a lot of different options there uh, for monitoring that. Now, Grafana and Prometheus and those types of tools are generally the the open source tools that are used by the community. However, Azure Monitor will work with AKS and it's pretty straightforward to set that up. You just have to build the dashboards and that kind of thing. Um, next question is, Is can you discuss the plat platform as a service services that would be used um, on a Kubernetes, um, sorry, let me reread re 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 this. Can you discuss how platform as a service apps uh, services would be used on uh, Azure using Kubernetes cluster. Is uh, It's unclear to me uh, where one ends and one begins. Okay. Uh, okay. The platform as a service is on Azure. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about something like app services and, or Azure container instances or the new offering, which is Azure container apps. There's basically on Azure, you have I'm gonna say five, maybe six different ways to run containers. There is the flagship offering, which is Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes Services. You have OpenShift, which is um, Kubernetes plus Red Hat's um, value-added services with it, with Azure uh, integration that is managed by Red Hat and Azure, and it's a Kubernetes experience. Uh, you have Azure Container Instances, which is platform as a service, that is the one that basically allows you to spin up single instances of, of, of containers that is pretty much fully managed and it just basically exposes a, a container to the, to the internet. And uh, that is one way to run it. You can use app, app services for containers 
which is basically the ability to run an HTTP based web app inside of app services. So you can run you know, things that aren't natively supported by app services. Like say you wanted to run Ruby apps, you can containerize it, put it on app services and it exposes it through port 80 or port 443. And then the other one that I didn't mention is Azure. It's a brand new service. It's called Azure Container Apps, which is basically an abstraction on top of Kubernetes that gives you microservice infrastructure without having to manage microservice infrastructure. So where does the platform as a service end and where does AKS uh, uh, pick up? I, 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 the, 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 the answer to that question is it does, the, it, is containers by virtue kind of blur that line a little bit. And the reason I say that is because um, containers by virtue of the way they they work is they're not really fully infrastructure as a service, but they're not fully platform as a service too. They're kind of a shared experience. And so anytime you build a container, you're, you're kind of taking on some of the responsibility that platform as a service does, such as creating the environment. Uh, in the case of an Nginx based web server, you need to provision that, that, that web server inside the container. That's something that infrastructure typically does, but I don't have to provision the virtual machine or the operating system for that to run. And that's kind of where it blurs the line between infrastructure and platform as a service. So the answer to that question is, is it that where one ends and where the other one starts is really kind of a gray. It's more of a gradient. If you're gonna be in AKS and you're gonna be managing the infrastructure, you're gonna be a little bit closer to the metal and you're gonna be responsible for configuring things like ports and storage and all that kind of stuff, you're a little bit more towards the platform side with AKS, even though it's still a managed uh, service. If you go all the way to the other extreme and use something like Azure Container Instances, where you basically just say, here's the port number, here's my pot, here's my container, and it just comes up, then you're getting more towards the platform as a, as a service side. but between those two extremes, you have a lot of different offerings, the, the ones I've just named. So it's not exactly uh, you know, a bright line between platform as a service and and uh, infrastructure as a service, where one uh, starts and where the other one stops. It's more of a gradient. And that's why I answered that question that way. So I hope that's a long answer to kind of kind of give you an idea of where one ends and one doesn't. It's, the reality is that they don't. It's more of a, of a gradient between infrastructure as a service where you're a little closer to the metal with AKS and something that's almost fully managed with something like you might get with Azure container instances on Azure. Um, next question is, is does Kubernetes services mix pods of various customers or uh, or a Kubernetes service spin up per customer? Uh, considering implications of medical software, uh, e uh, API and, and, and these other kinds of questions like that. The, the, the short answer is, um, it depends. Uh, Kubernetes provides uh, a lot of tools for isolation. So it's got, it's got, you can have separate, you can separate the isolation at the networking layer. You can have isolated storage for, for different customers. You can do um, platform as a service um, and you can have isolated databases for different customers. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. So the tooling that you have in Kubernetes gives you the ability to carve it up however you want. And it provides high levels of segmentation between how, where you want to provide that, that, that's, that the division. So if you're selling software as a service and you want to segment it at the, you want to have a common uh, API, but you want to have separate storage, you can create an API layer in AKS and the, the API doesn't care. It's just receives a request, processes it, but the storage configuration for that might be different for every customer that's using that API. And so the part of the uh, bootstrap of any request is figuring out what storage container I'm gonna hit. And then you can isolate it saying, I wanna use this storage container for customer A, another isolated storage container for I, customer B, another one for customer C and so on. And so it's really up to you to, to figure that out based on all the tools that it provides. But yes, AKS can give you all of that, uh, it, depending on where you want to provide the, the segmentation between all of the various components of your application, which depends largely on the app itself. So that's that's the short answer. That's a, hopefully answers that question. Um, how does licensing work for Windows-based containers? That's a good question. Now, 
licensing on Windows based containers basically follows the Windows license. So when you pay for Windows license, a single Windows license will allow you to deploy as many containers on that particular node as you can within the context of that node. So if I create a single instance of Windows Server, I can deploy a thousand Windows containers on that single node um, if, as long as the, the node will handle it. Uh, and so I can have as many nodes, as many Windows containers as I want on that node as long as the node will handle it. That's basically how that, the licensing works. Basically what you're paying for is the license for each of the nodes that are running the underlying operating system. And then to that extent, to the extent that you can pack as many containers on that node as you want that are Windows containers, doesn't matter. If it's one or 50, the license covers one instance or a 50 instances of the, of the Windows container. So that's, uh, that's how the licensing works for Windows containers. So basically, as long as you have a license for the node, you have a license to run the containers on that node. That's how that works out. Um, uh, let's see, next question. I think this is the last one. So uh, we'll call it a wrap after this if um, uh, if no more questions come in. So this is the question one that says- question after this. Yeah, sure. Um, what are some, some ways to link DevOps to AKS? There is a ton of ways to do DevOps with AKS. I can't even begin to talk about it. You, But fundamentally, they all work the same way. So, uh, with the with a container workload, you uh, on AKS, uh, you have the deployment, you have the the containers, and then you have the 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 Kubernetes manifest files. The container uh, the container images are all built by Docker files. So that's that builds the container, and then that and then typically that that workload, you build a container, you push it to a container registry, and then once it's in the container registry, you take the, the Kubernetes manifest file, which we looked at a couple of examples of that, and then you deploy that to the Kubernetes cluster, which then pulls the image down from the container registry and then deploys that. How that workload is pretty much ubiquitous to any container deployment. Now, once you have an understanding of how that workload looks, the container the, the Docker files and the Kubernetes manifest files then get put into your code repository. And so that gets that can be on Azure DevOps, it can be in GitHub, it can be in Bitbucket, it doesn't matter. And then you basically configure the deployments, the, the, you basically configure a deployment pipeline to build the container, push the container to the container registry, and then orchestrate the deployment of that container image to the container runtime, which in this case is AKS, uh, using a deployment you know, plugin typically provided by whatever you're using to take the manifest file that's in your repo and apply it, just like we did at the command line, but it's basically gonna do that in an automated way. And so with GitHub, you would use GitHub Actions and that GitHub Actions, I mean, it's got some pre-packaged GitHub Actions that you can use to Create those workflows, and it's it's pretty much the same if you use Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps has some pre-built um, pipelines that you can use to build a container image, um, you know, push it to a registry, deploy the Kubernetes manifest files, um, and then the same would happen if you're using some other tool. Say you're using Jenkins, or maybe you're using Terraform, what have you. All of those kind of do something very similar. To that Terraform wouldn't build the images, but it would deploy them if you wanted to. And so you have all of these different kinds of DevOps tools that basically orchestrate that same workload. And because containers um, are pretty much ubiquitous and they're the same uh, across all the, the, the details of the, of, of the build are baked into the Kubernetes, uh, the Docker file and, and the details of the, of the deployment are baked into the, um, the YAML files, the manifest files. The what you put into the actual pipelines on your DevOps platform is pretty minimal. It's basically, how do I connect to my container registry? How do I connect to my Kubernetes cluster? And the and once you have that configured, you could you can pretty much use the out of box experience from GitHub or DevOps or whatever it might be that you're using to orchestrate that build and deployment of the container image by way of the manifest files. So that's you know, it, it, there's a lot of different ways to do that. 
but they all basically follow the same pattern that you know any Docker workload, fall, any container workloads that's build a container image, push it to a registry, deploy it to a container uh, run and time environment, and then configure it based on all of that. So any other any other questions related to this? Um, so we got one more question for you. Eric is asking, how do you introduce updates to a service running on AKS, and is there a canary uh, deployment methodology for AKS? There is. Uh, with the deployment, the deployment that I talked about on Azure, um, that deployment controller has all of that built into it. So you can basically uh, set up canary deployments doing that if you want to. You can do uh, partition, like you can do uh, rollbacks, you can do rolling updates, you can do connection draining, you can do canary deployments, A, B configurations. All of that is a part of that controller. And that controller is very robust in controlling those kinds of scenarios where if you want to do uh, those specifics that you you can definitely set all that up to that, uh, to um, have a, uh, a canary deployment, whatever it might be that you want to do. I mean, it supports a lot of different schemes for that very kind of use case that you, those various kinds of use cases that you might have for uh, those kinds of upgrades or rollbacks or whatever it might be. So that's all baked in the controller. Uh, I would point you to the documentation to, to, to go figure out all of those various uh, aspects of that because, again, it's just very detailed and very intricate in defining all what that's going to look like as part of that manifest file. Um, if you want a simpler way to do it, use app, uh, use container apps on Azure whenever that GA is. It's got a lot of that built into the platform. And so container apps in that case will basically just allow you to use ARM templates to do a lot of that. Uh, and it simplifies a lot of that process. But it's generally oriented towards microservices. If you don't want to deal with that, you can use Azure App Services. Uh, app Services would give you a similar deployment if you had a container and you wanted to use, um, you know, canary deployments and or AB configurations, whatever, using deployment slots in a container in that regard. So, um, I didn't see that question come through, so I didn't. It didn't come up in the. It didn't pop up in the question. But if uh, if that's all the questions, then I think we're we're kind of up against the. We we can't haven't quite run out of time yet. We have about ten minutes left, but uh, I'll definitely give uh, give that back to you if you uh, if there's no more questions and. Uh, Thanks for uh, reaching out, and um, we love the, your love your feedback on the survey. Sorry about the the technical glitches here. I don't know what was going on. My 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 machine um, did some stuff, some crazy stuff uh, where the the screen wasn't showing. But uh, I think we got through those details. Hopefully, this has been uh, informative and got you uh, oriented for Azure Kubernetes Services. And we'll definitely be posting this, uh, um, and you'll can review it at your leisure. So. Thanks for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.